Or the restless waves send the light, send the light. There are souls to rest. The shore, send the light, the blessed gospel light. Spirit everywhere be found in the light, in the light, in the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. And the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Weary in the work of love. Gather jewels for a crown above. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Amen. All right, you may be seated tonight, or this morning, excuse me. Uh, already thinking about tonight. Good to see you. Thank you for being here. We had a great Sunday school uh, this morning with uh, Dr. Caldwell. He sang, tickled the ivories this morning. That was good with a song he wrote about the shepherd. So uh, that was a wonderful blessing, and so I appreciate that. Also, he told us about taking his wife out to eat and said uh, he takes her places where they don't have to <laughs> unwrap their food. I'll never forget that. So... Uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. That's good. That was good, uh, good stuff. All right, uh, just remember, too, we've got our missions conference, our missions revival, Monday and Tuesday night. So remember, 7 o'clock, uh, we're going to have that meeting here. And so I think it would be a blessing. That would be a good opportunity to get other folks in from around the area and so forth. So I appreciate him coming, and it's been a good morning so far. All right, Brother Raji. Hey, Brother Dirk knows why his mind was on tonight. Because there's mention of food, salad, or something. <laughs> then he mentioned the food here, so that's where it's at. That's where his mind's going uh, right now. <laughs> All right. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements. Yes, Again, uh, Dr. Caldell was here this morning. If you weren't here for Sunday school, you missed a great message. Uh, glad to have him here. And again, he'll be here uh, tonight, tomorrow night, and Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. And then uh, there'll be no Wednesday night service because of Monday and Tuesday night that we'll be here as well. Uh, also, uh, next Sunday, we're going to have Dr. Lee Watts in. Uh, he's the one that's uh, chaplain to the state legislator. Uh, we support him as well. Uh, he'll be here next Sunday, March 21st. And then also, uh, Brother Joe Decker will be here on April the 18th. So looking forward to uh, these next couple of guests as well. And then also, we have anniversary, uh, Brother Larry and Miss Ann Sharp on the 19th of this month. How long, Brother? 27 years. Now, when she's here, we're going to ask her, make sure you're correct. I, I was hoping she'd keep it 
<laughs> okay, 27 years. <laughs> Congratulations. Also, we got a birthday, uh, Miss Myra. I won't ask, but 319 <laughs> as well. And then uh, I guess that's about it. Uh, yeah. I guess that's it. Brother Derek. Let's all take a hymn, but let's stand again. Let's turn to hymn 384. That's 384. I am happy in the service of the king. Hymn 384. Hymn 384. I am happy in the service of the king. I am happy, oh, so happy. I have peace and joy that nothing else can bring. In the service of the King, in the service of the King, every talent I will bring. I have peace and joy and blessing in the service of the King. I am happy in the service of the King. I am happy, oh so happy, through the sunshine and the shadow I can see. In the service of the King, in the service of the King, every talent I will bring. I have peace and joy and blessing in the service of the King. I am happy in the service of the King. I am happy, oh so happy, all that I possess to Him I gladly bring. In the service of the King, in the service of the King, every talent I will bring. I have peace and joy and blessing in the service of the King. Let's continue singing this morning. Let's turn hymn 370, that's 370, hymn 370, throw out a lifeline across the dark wave. M 370 Throw out a lifeline across the dark wave There is a brother whom someone should say Somebody's brother, oh who then will dare To throw out the lifeline, his peril to share Throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline Someone is drifting away Throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline Someone is sinking today Throw out the lifeline with hand quick and strong Why do you tarry, why linger so long? See, he is sinking, oh hasten today And out with the lifeboat, away then away Throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline Someone is drifting away Lifeline, throw out the lifeline. Someone is sinking today. Throw out the lifeline to danger from men. Sinking in anguish wherever you have there been. Oops, winds of temptation and billows of woe will soon hurl them out where the dark waters flow. Throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline. Someone is drifting away. Throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline, someone is sinking today. Soon will the season of rescue be o'er, soon they will drift to eternity shore. Haste then, my brother, no time for delay, but throw out the lifeline and save them today. Throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline. Okay, very good. 
Uh, well, our preachers, uh, Brother Scott Caldwell, Dr. Scott Caldwell, we sure do appreciate him being here from the hills of North Carolina is the way he said it this morning. And I like that. And uh, now he's in the hills of Georgia, and he's, he's now uh, President General Director of the uh, Macedonia World Baptist Missions, an organization that sends out preachers all over the world. And so we're grateful we support several of the, 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 those preachers, uh, those church planners all over the world. Now, that's wonderful. In fact, he said something today. I've captioned it. I thought it was a great quote. He, he did. He did a whole series sermon on uh, Mark sixteen fifteen. He says, "Where there is a creature, there is a preacher." That's God's intention. And I thought, what a wonderful uh, summation of what he said this morning. And so we appreciate that. And that's really the goal. We want to get those preachers. It's by the preaching of the word, right? This foolishness of the world, but to us that are saved, it is the power of God. And so, what a wonderful, wonderful thought. And so, I appreciate that. I'm looking forward to what God's going to do this morning. Tonight and then Monday and Tuesday. And so it's going to be a great meeting, and I'm so thankful he'd make his way up here and uh, be a blessing to us. And to let you know, I know we got the uh, over here. I made this meeting with him two years ago, and I think I, I called or sent an email, and he called me back, and it surprised me. The phone was a little gargled, and, I, and he said, I'm sorry for the quality of this phone call. He said, but I'm in Germany, and I wanted to call you and talk to you about this meeting. And so... I thought that's pretty fascinating that he'd call me all the way from Germany. He was on one of his trips. And so I say that because they love Germany. And if you know anything about, uh, she cooks all kind of stuff, so you have to see it one day. All right. Well, Brother Calder, if you could come. Uh, I think he's also going to sing for us this morning, and that'll be a blessing as well. And we sure do thank you. Thank Appreciate you, it, Brother. Preacher. Well, turn in your Bible, if you would please, to the book of Romans, chapter number 5. Romans, chapter number 5. And in just a few moments, I'm going to begin reading. Uh, in verse number 12 of that chapter, I thought I'd already give you the text and then you can be uh, turning there as you're finding your place this morning on your way out. I noticed that a few of you have already come by the table and picked up Macedonia's latest copy of the Focus on the Field magazine. These are absolutely free of charge and I just want to make sure you get one and if we run out of the ones on the table, believe me, I've got plenty more where they come from and that will just allow you to become somewhat more acquainted with our missionary families around the world and let you know what I do as uh, the general director of Macedonia. I pastored for 22 years before God led us into the uh, mission uh, full time. And uh, this May will make seven years that Cassie and I stepped out by faith. No director at Macedonia receives any kind of financial benefit. We have to raise all of our support just like our missionaries to China and Japan and to Mexico. And so we started deputation seven years ago. And I guess I'll be on deputation until Jesus comes. So uh, it's a great, great blessing for me to be here today. More than anything else on that table, I told you a little bit about the CDs earlier. They are available. But more than anything else on that table, I encourage you, if you would please, pick up a prayer card card on the way out. And if you would commit to praying with us, uh, we're probably traveling just in road miles now, not including air miles, probably about 50,000 miles a year. And I don't know if you spend much time on the road, but people have lost their minds. Can I get an amen right there? I mean, just about everybody you meet now on the road is they're checking their email, they're doing a report, they're texting and, and doing this, that, and the other, and it's very dangerous out there. So if you could help us pray, and I know, I, I, especially when Cassie's not here, I always like to say some of you look at that picture and you think, my, how in the world could somebody like you get to marry somebody like that right there? That's, now, you never say it, but that's what you're thinking. And well, the only thing I got to say about that is some of us have it and some of us don't. That's the only thing I say. But I thought about a song I could sing before I preach about world evangelism this morning. Here's another song I wrote a few years ago. I was still pastoring and I was scheduled to sing on a mission Sunday. And I looked at several missions songs. I wanted to sing something about evangelism that day and just couldn't get peace in my heart about any song that I looked at. And I'd looked at several. And so Saturday night late, I just went to the Lord and I said, Lord, would you give me some words that I could just put with a, with a tune and take to church tomorrow to sing on World Mission Sunday? So late that Saturday night, this is what God gave me. And I want to share with you this morning what God shared with me that night. This is a song that just reminds us that Jesus came to die for all the world. Somewhere in the world 
a day There's a hurting multitude Who has yet to hear That Jesus died for them That Christ was buried But he rose again Now he lives forevermore To redeem the world And save us from our sin There is hope for the hopeless In the Savior There is help for the helpless In the Lord So let us take the gospel story to reach and everyone Jesus came to die for all the world for the rich man in the palace for the beggar home the street Jesus shed his blood for all Sin's power to defeat He conquered death, hell, and the grave Now he gives us victory And he offers his salvation To everyone who will believe Will you believe? There is hope for hopeless in the Savior. There is help for the helpless in the Lord. So let us take the gospel story to preach, and everyone Jesus came to die for all the world. The Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Yes, Jesus came to die for all the world. Amen thankful this morning for a whosoever gospel. Amen. I'm glad that included me. Amen. Aren't you glad that it included you? Praise the Lord. Have you found your place in Romans chapter number five? If so, would you please stand with me as we read the Bible together? It has been said, and I agree, the book of Romans is the most statesmanlike presentation of the gospel in all of the Bible. I believe you and I witnessed such a presentation as we zero in on this, the last portion of the fifth chapter of the book of Romans. The Apostle Paul writes, beginning with verse 12 of the chapter, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. 
Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I want to encourage you to leave your Bibles open. All few points of my message will be taken directly from the text that I've just been blessed to read within your hearing. And by the way, you'll hear me say that a lot throughout the course of my preaching this week and I'll tell you why. When it comes to world evangelism, in fact, when it comes to really anything, it doesn't matter what Brother Caudill says. But brother, it matters a whole lot what God has to say. And therefore, I'm not here to give you my opinion. I'm not here to share rhetoric with you this week. I'm here to tell you what thus saith the Lord. And so all few points of my message will be taken directly from the text that I've just been blessed to read within your hearing. Let's bow our heads, shall we, for a moment of prayer. Father, you've already been so good to us here at the Lighthouse Baptist Church this week. Thank you for the wonderful Sunday school hour. Thank you for the great uh, time of fellowship together. Thank you for the congregational singing. Now, Father, I pray that your stamp of approval would be upon the preaching of your word. Lord, I'm nothing without you, and you know I want to be a blessing to this dear pastor, his family, and to the wonderful church family of the Lighthouse Baptist Church of Taylorsville, Kentucky. So, Father, use me this morning to that end, and I'll give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. With the help of the Lord, I felt impressed of the Lord to preach on this thought from these verses of Scripture. Grace that makes the case for world evangelism. Now, I've used that title because as you and I were blessed to read this particular portion of the Word of God, I believe that is exactly what the Bible has made us aware of. Here in this chapter before us, I believe you and I see a picture of what God can and yes, even will do. For every man, woman, boy, or girl that comes to him by faith for their soul's salvation. And therefore, I can certainly assure you that the verses of Scripture that I've just been blessed to read within our hearing are uh, certainly worthy of our consideration this morning. Now, in just a few moments, I'll zero in on the latter portion of the chapter but it is as we study the entire chapter uh, that we'll be able to see even greater truths in the latter portion. So let's consider the chapter as a whole by way of introduction to the message. I believe here in Romans chapter number 5, the Holy Spirit of God inspires the Apostle Paul to paint three different pictures that are worthy of our consideration this morning. First of all, notice the first five verses of the chapter. In verses 1 through 5, we see the first picture the Lord uses Paul to paint in this chapter. Here, ladies and gentlemen, in verses 1 through 5, we see a picture of God lifting us. I say that because Paul declares as early as these few verses of Scripture that the child of God has been justified by faith to the point that we now have peace with God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's why I say in verses 1 through 5 of this chapter, we see a wonderful picture of God lifting us. Now, beginning with verse number 6 and continuing through verse 11, we see the second picture that God is using Paul to paint in this chapter. God lifts us, verses 1 through 5, but in verses 6 through 11, we see a picture of God loving us. 
In fact, Romans chapter number five and verse number eight is not only one of my favorite verses in Romans chapter number five. Brother, it's one of my favorite verses of scripture in all of the Bible. Romans chapter number five and verse eight says, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For those of you that mark in your Bible, oh, listen, you ought to underline that word commendeth. You ought to highlight that word commendeth. You ought to circle that word commendeth. It is a word that literally means to place on display. You see, that word commendeth is a word in our King James Bibles that assures us beyond any shadow of a doubt that God did much more than just say to a lost and dying world, I love you. Oh no, God put his love on display. And if you're wondering how God did that, let me call your attention once again, if I may, to the verse of scripture I quoted during the song that reminds us that Jesus came to die for all of the world. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, John three seventeen says, but that the world through him might be saved. We see that picture here in verses 6 through 11 of Romans chapter 5. So in verses 1 through 5, God lifts us. Verses 6 through 11 of this chapter, God loves us. But then that brings us to the third and final picture that God uses Paul to paint in the final portion of the chapter. Beginning with verse 12 and continuing through verse 21, Paul is used of the Lord to paint a picture of God loosing us. He loves us, verses 6 through 11. He lives us, verses 1 through 5. But in verses 12 through 21, our key text this morning, God looses us. He looses us, friend, from the power of sin. Now let's dig in here for just a few moments and consider the truth of the word of God. In verses 12 through 13 and 14, Paul speaks of sin. He speaks of sin's presence, first portion of verse 12. He speaks of sin's penalty, latter portion of verse 12. And he ultimately speaks of sin's power in verses 13 and 14. So Paul not only speaks of the entrance of sin, he speaks of the effect of sin in our life. He speaks of sin, verses 12 through 14. But beginning with verse 15 and continuing through the final verse of the chapter, Paul takes his speaking of sin to yet another level. Now he begins to study sin. And as Paul begins to study Study sin. According to the text, he declares emphatically and without apology that the solution for humankind's sin is salvation by grace through faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And we know that to be the case because the Bible teaches us in verse 20 where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Do you know what that means? Let me tell you what that means. That means our sin is great. But whereas our sin is great, God's grace is greater. Amen. Where sin abounded, grace didn't much more abound. It means our sin is big. But whereas our sin is big, God's grace is bigger. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. It means that sin is high. But whereas our sin is high, God's grace is higher. Grace did much more abound. This, ladies and gentlemen, is grace that makes the case for world evangelism. And therefore, for the next very few moments, I'm going to take my Bible and call your attention, if I may, to a few truths directly from the text, which in turn I trust God will use to lay a foundation again for what your pastor has felt impressed to the Lord to lead us into doing this week. 
First of all, when I look into these verses of Scripture, I see, number one, a problem that is universal. I see a problem that is universal here in the text. It's interesting here in the latter portion of Romans chapter 5, Paul speaks of a very real and may I say a very relevant problem when it comes to humankind as a whole. Notice verse number 12. Verse number 12, Paul writes, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon how many men? Somebody say it for me. All men for that how many have sinned? Somebody say it for me. All have sinned. Now let me stop right there long enough to ask this question. Do you see the problem? It is not only a personal problem in that it affects me. It is a popular problem in that it affects you and your neighbor and your friend and the people of India and the people of Egypt and the people of the world. I see a problem here and that problem is a universal problem. Now, how many of you would agree this morning, whenever we read and study the Bible, if God mentions something once in the pages of His Word, well, that's certainly worthy of our consideration. Amen? I mean, after all, when I hold this Bible in my hand, I hold beyond a shadow of a doubt the inspired, inerrant, infallible, impeccable, indestructible Word of the living God of glory. And if God only merely touched upon something for one time, it would certainly be worthy of our consideration and of our attention. But what if God says something over and over and over again. Would you tend to think that God through the pen of the writer is trying to get a point across? Well, I want you to know in verse number 12 of this chapter, God through the pen of the apostle Paul begins to address this problem that is universal, but he doesn't stop in verse number 12. Look if you would please in verse number 15. In verse number 15 of the chapter, the Bible declares that through the offense of one, many are dead. Look at verse 16. Verse 16 declares that since one has sinned, that judgment was by one to condemnation. Look at verse 17. According to verse 17, since one man offended God, death reigned by one. Verse 18 declares that through the offense of one, judgment came upon how many men to condemnation? All men to condemnation. Verse 19 teaches us that by one man's disobedience, how many were made sinners? Many were made sinners. Listen to me. You or I, either one, will never fully appreciate the superiority of grace until we first and foremost realize the severity of our problem. I've got a problem. You've got a problem. All of mankind, we've got a problem. And that problem is sin. Now, having considered the text that I've just read within our hearing, let's address this question, shall we? Who is the one that sinned? Who is the one that disobeyed God? And even more importantly, what does this one and this one's actions have to do with me, or for that matter, the people of the world? Well, the Bible is abundantly clear. The one that sinned, the one that disobeyed, the one that offended God was our forefather Adam. And when our great, 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 great granddaddy Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, he plunged humankind as a whole headlong into sin. That is exactly why Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 22, In Adam all die because the wages of sin is death. Brother, we've got a problem. 
That's why Romans chapter 3 and verse number 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That is why Romans chapter 3 and verse 12 declares, There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Can I just say it like this this morning? That's why the world is in the shape that it's in right now at this present moment. The world is as it is because you and I are as we are. We're sinners. Through Adam, we all die. Through Adam, we're all sinners. Through Adam, we all fall short of the glory of God. It is a universal problem. And I must say, if the text stopped by simply revealing the problem, we'd have no hope. You would have no hope. But the same Bible that teaches us, number one, about the problem that is universal is the same Bible that teaches us, secondly, about a provision that is undeniable. Oh, yes, the Bible does teach us through one we all die. But the same Bible teaches us through another one we all have the potential of living. And so who is this other one? Well, Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ... <laughs> shall all be made alive. Paul said in verse number 45 of 1 Corinthians 15, and so it is written, the first man Adam was made a living soul, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. And of course, when you study the Bible, you'll discover that the last Adam, sometimes he is referred to as the second Adam, the Bible is speaking of none other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And here in the latter portion of Romans chapter 5, Paul, as he was led of the Holy Ghost to do so, begins to compare the two. Look what your Bible says in verse 15. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God, and the gift by grace which is by one man, Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many. Verse 17, Paul continues to contrast the first Adam with the last Adam. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. God's not through. Now he's driving this undeniable provision home in our hearts and in our minds. Look at verses 18 and 19. The Bible says, Therefore is by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And therefore, having read the text before us, we can say it like this and be scripturally correct in saying it. The first Adam reigned over doomed humanity. But the second Adam reigns over delivered humanity. Through the first Adam again came a problem that was universal. But through the last Adam, through the second Adam, comes a provision that is undeniable. And that provision is mercy. That provision is grace. Oh, thank God for the grace of God. It is that grace, ladies and gentlemen, that makes the case for what we're doing here this week when we focus on world evangelism. Hey, let me encourage you to go back through these verses of Scripture during your daily devotions this week and underline every time you see the word gift. The word gift is used six times in Romans chapter 5 alone. You'll see it twice in verse 15, twice in verse 16, one time in both verses 17 and 18. Six times the word gift is used in the text. Six times the word grace is used in the text. You'll see it in verse 2, twice in verse 15, and you'll see it in verses 17, 20, and 21. Six in your King James Bible is the number of man. 
Do you know what God is saying in this chapter? Man has failed God. Man has fallen short for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So says the word of God. Man has dropped the ball. Man has uh, failed the Lord. But grace Grace is extended to sinful man. God, oh listen, somebody said one time, God isn't fair. Oh listen, you don't want fair from God because if you and I both got fair, we'd be in hell right now. But I'm, st- I'm so thankful instead of giving us what we stand deserving of, God extends mercy and God extends grace. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a provision that is undeniable. Do you know what that means? Let me tell you what that means. Through the first Adam, I'm lost. But through the second Adam, I'm saved. Through the first Adam, I'm on my way to hell. But through the second Adam, I'm on my way to heaven. Through the first Adam, I'm a debtor. But through the second Adam, the debt has been canceled. Do you know what these verses of Scripture teach us? These verses of Scripture teach us that we gained much more in Jesus that we ever lost in Adam. That's exactly what verse 15 says. When it says, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, watch your Bible, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. You see the words much more again in verse 17. And then you see it in verse 20. When the Bible says, moreover the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, what did much more amount? Grace, and it's that grace that makes the case for world evangelism. And so we see the problem that is universal in the text. We see the provision that is undeniable. And finally, we see the possibilities that must be understood. When it comes to the truth of this Bible, when it comes to the truths presented in Romans chapter 5, There are two possibilities that must be understood. First of all, there is the possibility of condemnation. We see the possibility of condemnation in the first portion of verse 21 where the word of God plainly teaches that if a person chooses to reject God's free offer of eternal life and forgiveness through the Lord Jesus Christ, then that individual will ultimately choose to remain in his sin and die and go to hell. Now I want to tell you what this Bible teaches, and I know your pastor preaches this. I'm preaching to the choir this morning. Sometimes it's good for you to know that there are other people that believe this besides just your preacher. If a man rejects God's free offer of salvation, and he dies in his sin, and he goes to hell, he'll go to hell out of the divine will of God. And the reason why we know that is because of what the Bible teaches in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 9, where the word of God reveals that God is not willing that any should perish. God is not willing for the people of Egypt to perish. God is not willing for the people of India to perish. That's why you send Brother Jordan Gazaway and his wife Celeste and his precious children there. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Let me just put it as plain as I know how to put it. God doesn't send people to hell. Men choose to go there when they reject God's free offer of salvation. You see, there is something, as we'll see later on in our studies this week while I'm here, that God sacredly guards all through the canon of Scripture. Do you want to know what it is? The will of man. 
God, even though He longs for you to be saved, even though He has made provision for you to be saved, even though He desires for you to be saved, He wants you to be saved so much that He sent the best that He had. God gave heaven's best for the world's worst so that the world's worst might know and experience heaven's best. God wants you to be saved. But listen to me. He's not going to force you to be saved. He's not. He presents you with his gift of salvation. That is exactly what he's doing right now through this preacher. If you're here and you're lost this morning, if you have never met Christ as your personal Savior, God through this simple, short, sobering Bible message is presenting you with his gift of salvation. And he says to you who may be lost, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. But I assure you, he's not going to force you to accept it. He's going to leave it up to you. But if you reject it, then what you are doing is deliberately choosing to reject God's free offer of salvation, die in your sin, and go to hell. Can I say it once more? God sends no man to hell. Men freely choose to go there. When they reject God's free offer, of salvation. And so there is the possibility of condemnation. But then, thank God, there is the possibility of conversion. These verses of Scripture teach us this morning that if a man having come to the realization that he needs Jesus, that if a man comes to the realization that he cannot save himself, that it takes more than just turning over a new leaf, and that individual having realized his need of a Savior, if he is willing to turn from his sin to the Savior, that is to say, he wants Jesus more than he wants anything else. God has given us his word. Therefore, if any man come to Christ, he is a new creature. All things, all things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Jesus said, if any man will come to me, I will in no wise cast out. And so if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, there is the possibility of conversion this morning. If you'd realize this grace, this grace that makes the case for world evangelism has been extended Yes, to the people of India. Yes, to the people of Brazil. But this grace that makes the case of world evangelism has been extended to you. What will you do with grace that makes the case for world evangelism? You've listened so well. Would you bow your head with me, Lord Jesus? Oh, thank you for your word. What a blessing this morning to have considered the truths of your word. Oh, Lord, may we never take it for granted. First of all, my Father, I pray, should there be one within the sound of my voice right now that doesn't know you as Lord and as Savior. Oh, Lord, I pray today would be the day of their salvation before it is eternally too late. And then, Lord, I pray for those of us who are saved. Oh, I pray that you would impress upon our hearts the need to take this same gospel message, to extend this free offer of grace to a lost and dying world while we have opportunity to do so. And Lord, for challenging us this week, for changing us, my Father, that we may be more like Thee. I'll give you glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Can I ask you the most important question that you'll ever be asked in your lifetime? Do you know Jesus as your personal Savior? Have you ever realized your need of a Savior? Has there been a time in your life when you having 
saw that need, turned to the Lord Jesus and prayed a prayer somewhat like this, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Come into my heart, forgive me of my sin, save me by your good grace. If you're here this morning and you've never prayed such a prayer, maybe you're here this morning and you're just not sure if you were to die today that heaven would be your home. Oh, listen, I'd love to pray for you. Would you just slip your hand up and say, Preacher, that's me, that's me. I'm just not sure if I were to die today that I'd go to heaven. Would you please pray for me? Is there one like that here? Anywhere at all? I just want to pray for you. Then my father, I pray right now. As Pastor Wilkins comes and prepares to conclude this service as he feels impressed of you to do so, oh Lord, would you burden our hearts this week about the great need of the world? Oh Lord, you teach us in your word that you are not willing that any should perish. That tells me the people of Brazil need to hear about this life-changing message. They need to hear about the problem that is universal, yes, but they need to hear about the provision that is undeniable, the provision of grace, the provision of mercy. Oh God, give us a greater burden to reach the world with the gospel than we've ever had before. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Pastor. Let's stand to our feet as Brother Derek, Mr. Smith, leader of song. I invite you to come. Perhaps the Lord spoke to your heart. I trust that he has. We invite you to come. Mm -hmm. All to Jesus I surrender. Thank you so very much.